I'm so delighted to be here with you all, with all the many faces I can see on the screen in front of me. Uh, and thank you for being here to listen to me. Uh, my theme is a theology of suffering and British poetry of the First World War. At this terrible time for the country of Ukraine, I don't presume to theologize directly about the suffering of soldiers and the civilian population in this war that has been inflicted so cruelly upon them. That will be out of place, I think, for me as a theologian who's sitting comfortably outside the zone of conflict and, and watching, though with huge sympathy from afar. But I know that you want to think about the relation between theology and creative literature as a way of living through the trauma that war brings. So I hope it might be helpful to reflect theologically on the work of poets from another time of war as they expressed their traumatic experience of death and destruction and tried to come to terms with it. I mean poets who wrote during and shortly after the First World War from 1914 to 1918. These poets wanted to talk to God about the horrors they were experiencing. And they wanted to talk about God in the context of suffering. Often the talk was a protest, although sometimes it was a kind of doubting faith a tentative and ambiguous belief, as in this poem by Edmund Blunden, who fought in the trenches. I have been young and now I'm not too old, and I have seen the righteous forsaken, his health, his honor and his quality taken. This is not what we were formally told. I have seen a green country, useful to the race, not silly with guns and mines, its villages vanquished, even the last rat and last kestrel banished. God bless us all. This was peculiar grace. Say what you will. Right. Say what you will. Our God sees how they run. These disillusions are his curious proving that he loves humanity and will go on loving. Over there are faith, life, virtue in the sun. Here the poet Blunden can find no clear evidence for the love of God in the scenes of destruction around him. And he lacks the confidence of the writer of Psalm 37, who says, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. In fact, Blunden here contradicts the psalm. But something still urges him to believe despite the evidence. There must, he thinks, be something more than this. Something, he says, over there. The ravaged world around him can't be the whole story. But whether writing in a mood of protest or a questioning trust, the poets find that they need to keep the conversation going to talk about God and suffering. And my aim tonight is to share in that conversation. I want to take the opportunity of your invitation to reflect on a Christian approach to the problem of suffering in human life. My intention isn't to think directly about the ethics of war, but to think theologically about the problem of suffering that war raises so sharply. Our suffering is not exactly the same as the soldiers of World War I, but wherever we are suffering, it has its own agonies. The testimony of the war poets will help us to ground our theology in concrete reality or perhaps in the context of the trenches, I should say, muddy reality. Now let's be clear right at the beginning that all talk about suffering fails in the end. 
No religious argument about the reasons for suffering is finally convincing. We cannot finally explain how a good God could make a world in which there is pain. Blunden, in his poem we've read, speaks about a curious proving. He doesn't have proof of the love of God in the normal sense of the word. It's impossible finally to solve the problem of suffering, and it may actually be harmful to try and do so. If we have a cast iron intellectual argument to explain suffering, we may end up by accepting it and justifying suffering. Christian thinkers in the majority world today, what we used to call the third world, are especially critical of the way that Western Christians spend so much time and effort trying to solve the problem of suffering. The point, they say, is not to explain suffering, but to remove it. Especially, we need to tackle the deep underlying issues of poverty, injustice, and equality that cause suffering in our world. We're so busy making our clever theologies that we fail to transform the financial and political structures that are oppressing people. But if we're Christian believers, we do need, I think, to talk about the relation of God to suffering in our world. If God is at the heart of life, then we need to express how we feel about where God is in a situation of suffering. This is what the poets of World War I tell us. They had to bring God into the conversation, to put God on the scene, even on the spot. And it's no less true for us. Suppression is unhealthy. And any burying of resentments and protest will only break out in destructive forms later on. Trauma sufferers are often driven into silence and brooding and lose communication with other people and with God. Having some idea of how God as creator and the supreme lover of humankind relates to suffering may help to re-establish that communication at the right time. There'll be a proper time for such understanding, and it probably won't be the actual moment of acute suffering. It wasn't at the moment of going over the top of the trenches in the First World War. It won't be for us at the actual moment of the loss of a child or the sudden loss of a partner in fighting that we never expected, or the sudden discovery of having a terminal illness. But at some time, it may help to reflect in a thoughtful way on the relation of God to suffering in our world. I began by saying that no argument put up by the Christian faith is finally convincing. We can't fully explain suffering and evil, but a thoughtful faith may help to move us towards the point where we can go on living in the world with trusting God. It may help to see that belief in a loving creator is at least reasonable and consistent with what we know about the way the world works. We can talk about God and suffering just a little. We're embarked this evening on a very modest venture, not justifying God in the face of suffering, but trying to talk about God and suffering in one breath. And again, I want to say that I'm not presuming to comment directly on the experience of trauma in Ukraine at the moment, its cause and its solution, but to think more generally about God's relation to human suffering. And so we move on to something that lies at the heart of a Christian view of the world, which is the freedom of creation. In beginning to grapple generally with the mystery of evil and suffering, Christianity affirms that God is the kind of creator who makes a universe which has a great deal of its own freedom to be itself. In the Christian view, 
God's purpose in making the universe was to make many living beings with whom to enter into relationship. Beings who could enjoy the fellowship of divine love, such as God knows in God's own being. The Christian vision of God is of a divine life which is relational. The Christian picture of God as Trinity portrays a dynamic interweaving or dance of relationships. Relations of giving and receiving in love, like those between a father and a son, or a parent and a child, in an eternal spirit of newness and hope. Created beings are made to join this fellowship. They're invited into an eternal festival of joy and love. Among those beings are the personal beings we call human, women and men. They have a special place in creation with special tasks and responsibilities, though the Christian faith makes clear that God enjoys a relationship with all living beings, the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the lamb and the tiger, as the poet William Blake put it. Now persons need a great deal of freedom. They can't be controlled like puppets or robots, but must be free to make their own decisions. They also need to be free in order to be creative, to make new things which will contribute to God's own project in creation. Whether these new things are paintings, poems and music, or technology which makes for better living conditions for all people. The Christian view of the world is that God wants created beings to share in the act of ongoing creation. The point is that freedom like this will involve suffering in at least two ways. In thinking about these, I must ask your patience in not returning just yet to the war poets because I want to do some theological thinking first. First, there's the suffering that seems to be built into the very process of growth and development. In the evolution of sentient beings, let alone persons, there's a painful journey in which sacrifices have to be made by some for the sake of others. Some species die out for others to have the chance of life. So a certain amount of suffering seems to belong to the very emergence of life with all its possibilities. If creation is to be free, then there's also randomness and chance in events, a chaotic element that will in itself create some pain. Metal fatigue may cause a break to fail just at the moment when a bus is passing through a busy street rather than when it's in the depot. Further, if human beings are to develop as moral persons, then some suffering seems to be necessary to help this growth. Mechanics aren't going to develop a sense of moral responsibility for the passengers of buses unless there is the danger of metal fatigue. Sailors are not going to develop a sense of responsibility for their ships unless there are storms they have to contend with and storms cause damage. At the simplest level, if fire didn't cause pain to the human skin, we might always be putting ourselves into it and losing our limbs. This kind of suffering is often called natural evil, but it would be better to call it natural suffering, a suffering which belongs to the very fabric of nature. It also seems to belong to the process of education, making us what we are as human persons. And whole philosophical theories about suffering have been built on this perception. However, such suffering can become an evil. It is evil when it is excessive, when it's far more damaging than seems to be necessary for the basic education of moral persons. And that's exactly how natural suffering often seems to be to us. The shifting of tectonic plates or ocean surges 
might be educational for us. It should teach us not to build flimsy buildings in earthquake zones or on low-lying ground. But we feel this isn't the whole story. So much harm is done to poor and innocent people who are forced to live in unsatisfactory conditions in Haiti or along the coast of Bangladesh. Educational theories of suffering seem cold and abstract, not meeting the reality of human life. And even among non-human animals in the forest or the jungle, there seems far too much pain in the natural world. So there's a second way in which freedom leads to suffering, and this has a lot of emphasis in the Christian faith. That is, there's a terrible risk that creatures will misuse their freedom. They will turn away from the good purposes of the creator and work out their own selfish desires. And this is often called moral evil. Now, the poets of war are often acutely conscious of human moral responsibility for the suffering they and others are enduring. Here, for example, is the poet Thomas Hardy picturing the dead who are sleeping in their tombs in church and being woken up by the sound of the big guns firing across the channel. He writes, That night your great guns unawares shook all our coffins as we lay and broke the chancel window squares. We thought it was the judgment day and sat upright till God called, no, it's gunnery practice out at sea. Just as before you went below, the world is as it used to be. All nations striving strong to make red war yet redder, mad as hatters, they do no more for Christ's sake than you who are helpless in such matters. Ha ha, it will be warmer when I blow the trumpet, if indeed I ever do, for you are men and rest eternal sorely need. According to Hardy, God declares that human beings are mad as hatters. This is an English idiom for having scrambled brains. But God will be generous with the true last judgment. Christian thinkers have maintained that to be real persons, we have to be created free to do either good or evil. The only other option is a world of puppets or robots. If doing the right is to have any meaning, there must be the alternative of doing the wrong, evil, with all the suffering this entails. We have to be free to be morally mad, as Hardy puts it, if this is what we want. Now, immediately, I suggest we can see two problems of the way this argument is put. If it's to have any force at all in explaining suffering, then we must modify it, I think, in two ways. First, this argument mustn't be taken to mean that any particular sufferer has used his or her freedom to do something wrong, and this is why they are suffering. The point is rather that humankind as a whole has used its freedom to turn away from God's purpose. Those who suffer may well be the victims of other people's sin, either in the present or perhaps through a legacy left from the past in social or genetic disorders, like landmines left in the soil for unwary people to tread on. Things have gone wrong in the misuse of God-given freedom, but we cannot fully trace where things have gone wrong. We may be the victims of a very complicated story that's developed over thousands, even millions of years. The war poets have a vivid sense of the combatants as victims of the moral choices of others, not their own. And second, this argument doesn't seem to cover the suffering that comes from non-human causes. I mean, viruses that call AIDS, cause AIDS, cancerous cells, microbes, and on a larger scale, earthquakes and floods. 
We can make human beings at least partly responsible for these by saying that if human persons had obeyed God as they ought to have done, then they could have worked together with God to overcome these disorders in nature. Human sinfulness makes destructive elements in nature worse. It's because of sin that human beings build cities on earthquake fault lines and are so concerned with gathering riches that they don't spend enough money on eradicating causes of disease. But not everything can be blamed on human, human sinfulness. Disorders and chaos are there beyond the human world. For this free will argument, to work, to cover all evil and suffering, we must take the freedom of all creation seriously. I've suggested that freedom means the pain of growth and the pain of randomness. Chance can be cruel. But more than this, we must also say, I believe, that the whole of creation has drifted away from God's purpose. It's not just human beings who failed to respond to God's aims for wholeness and life, but in some way, creation at every level has slipped away from God's vision for a good creation. We must conceive of God's spirit at work in the whole of the physical world, urging it towards flourishing and fullness of life, calling for cooperation and partnership in a way appropriate for its level of being. Everything can respond in some way to this summons, though human beings have the greatest capacity for doing so. The Bible puts this poetically, saying that God has made a covenant not only with human beings, but with every living creature, the birds, the cattle, the beasts of the earth. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 8. Not only human beings, but the world of nature sings praise to God in the Bible. The waves roar before him. The heavens pour forth speech. The trees of the field clap their hands as he comes to his world. And God plays with sea monsters in the deep. In the New Testament, according to Paul in Romans chapter 8, the whole universe is groaning as in childbirth, waiting for God to set it free, with its destiny deeply bound up with the redemption of God's human children. Well, this is certainly poetic language, but it offers testimony to some kind of response which the natural world can make or fail to make to the purposes of God. Because it's failed to respond to the urgings of the Holy Spirit, there is far too much pain in the world. This is why floods of microbes cause so much harm. When we suffer, I suggest, we're victims of a very long story in which human beings are not the only characters. War is a peculiarly intense conjunction of all these ideas about the exercise of freedom in creation. Isaac Rosenberg, in his poem, Dead Man Dump, strains language to express the interaction between human beings and the natural world. Through image, rather than through argument, he implies there is a kind of responsibility for wrong choices and lack of love that's shared by all, while humanity is especially guilty. He writes, maniac earth, howling and flying, your bowels seared by the jagged fire, the iron love, the imperious storm of savage love. Dark earth, dark heavens, swinging in chemic smoke. What dead are born when you kiss each soundless soul with lightning and thunder from your mind heart, which man's self dug and his blind fingers loosed? A man's brains spattered on a stretcher bearer's face. His shook shoulders slipped their load. But when they bent to look again, the drowning soul was sunk too deep for human tenderness. <laughs>
This argument for the freedom of the whole world and its creatures is the basic Christian understanding of suffering. This is the big idea. God doesn't send suffering or make people suffer. The question, why has God done this, is a mistake. God hasn't, or at least not directly. Not here and now as a kind of plan for our life. I want to make the definite statement here that you're very welcome to challenge afterwards in the question time. God never inflicts suffering, not even for reasons that, as people sometimes say, God knows best. But someone may say, why doesn't God intervene to stop it? If God doesn't cause suffering, why doesn't God prevent it? This was a constant plea of the poets. Sigrid Sassoon writes, Men jostle and climb to meet the bristling fire. Lines of grey, muttering faces, masked with fear. They leave their trenches, going over the top while time ticks blank and busy on their wrists, and hope with furtive eyes and grappling fists flounders in mud. Oh, Jesus, make it stop. Why doesn't God make it stop? The answer lies, I believe, in what I've been saying about the freedom God gives to creation and God's decision only to work in partnership in the world, in cooperation with the creatures God has made. In God's free decision to be a creator, God has limited God's self to working together with creation. To allow creation to grow and develop, God has made a fundamental decision to which God remains faithful, not to act in a uni unilateral way, but always only to act in persuasive love. God, by go God's own choice to be a creator, cannot intervene. But God can do new things in the world, even miraculous things, when God has the cooperation that God wants. And such a partnership happens not least in intercessory prayer, in which by God's own desire, our created love is joined with the force of divine, uncreated love. God's resources of love are endless and the pressure of his love on the world can wear down even the most stubborn resistance. But God still remains vulnerable to the response of created beings and they may go on resisting the divine love. Who can doubt that when faced with the mountain of misery of a Passchendaele in the First World War or a Holocaust or a genocide, that God wanted to move human wills to prevent these evils? We have to say that the weight of resistance to God's purpose in these cases meant that God could not shift the obstacle and have God's way. This is what St. Paul calls the weakness and the foolishness of God in human eyes. We measure power by the ability to get our own way. God is all powerful, omnipotent enough to be able to give mere force away. But of course, you can see that this argument about freedom doesn't let God off the hook. God is still to some extent in the dock, in court. God's choice to make a free world had a terrible risk in it. Things could go badly wrong, and they have. In choosing to create, God opened up the possibility for suffering. While the emergence of evil isn't absolutely necessary in our world, it's very likely to develop through free choices when human beings are immature and the divine glory is veiled. In short, God took a considerable risk. War above all shows the extent of that risk. This divine responsibility is expressed in a number of war poems. Here is Edward Thomas, prompted in his thoughts by hearing the roar of a flock of starlings in an oak tree, which sounds to him like the noise of war. He writes, 
Time swims before me, making as a day a thousand years, while the broad ploughland oak roars mill-like, and men strike and bear the stroke of war as ever, audacious or resigned. And God still sits aloft in the array that we have wrought him, stone deaf and stone blind. Thomas seems to recognize that the image of an all-powerful God up aloft on a throne is something that we have projected onto God. He says, God still sits aloft in the array that we have wrought him. But God still doesn't escape blame. That's why there can be no final intellectual answer to the problem of suffering. The question remains, is it worth it? In using arguments, we may talk about the risk that God took in creation, but it still remains open to decide whether God's decision to create like this is worth the cost. In Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov, one of the characters, Ivan, asked the question, is the whole universe worth the tears of one tortured child? He has in mind the story of a rich landowner who threw a peasant child to his dogs to be torn apart by them because the child had thrown a stone and broken a dog's leg. The mother had to look on while the child was tortured and killed. Is it worth the tears of one child, let alone the millions in Auschwitz in our day? Ivan thinks not and says that he is returning his entrance ticket to God with the polite observation that the price is too steep. Is it worth it? Wilfred Owen rewrites the story in the book of Genesis in which Abraham is first commanded by God to sacrifice his son, but then has his hand stayed at the last minute by the provision of another victim, a ram caught in a bush. In Owen's version, Abraham continues with the human sacrifice, as have the old men in command of the nations of Europe in Owen's day. Behold, calls an angel from heaven, a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Offer the ram of pride instead of him. But the old man would not do so, but slew his son and half the seed of Europe, one by one. We can't miss the poet's attribution of blame to those leaders of nations that have started the war. But he's also assigning blame to God who set the whole situation up in the first place. God, after all, has made it possible for the Abrahams of our day to succumb to their pride. So is it worth it? Well, I believe we may say that it is. The making of persons is worth all the tears, the delights of human love, the satisfactions of family life, the beauty of art, the joy of communion with God makes it all worth it. But it is a leap of faith to say this, the faith that comes from looking into the face of God. Only faith can answer the question, is it worth it? after all reasonable arguments have fallen silent. And part of that faith is a proper kind of protest. God is humble enough to allow us to protest, even when we trust in God. Protest is a healthy thing, a spiritual thing. Let me give you an example of this. Some years ago, I read in a national newspaper the comments of a social worker who serves the wards of a hospice caring for the dying. It's St Joseph's in London. This person had to cope with the distress of patients slowly wasting away from cancer, and she had to cope with difficult relatives who took their frustrations out on her. She wrote that the only thing that had kept her going through all this was that she was a Christian. She said, I'm very sure of the existence of a God, and this means I've got somebody 
to be flaming mad with. And we catch this same note of protest in a poem by Robert Graves, reflecting on the way that war reminds us of things in everyday life that are important and which we overlook in ordinary times. And we find that God has a place among them, even if only as a swear word, a word of protest. He writes, and old importances came flooding back. Wine, meat, log fires, a roof over the head, a weapon at the thigh, surgeons at call. Even there was a use again for God, a word of rage in lack of meat, wine, fire in ache of wounds beyond all surgeoning. When we're driven to cry, oh my God, we are saying more than we think. Now let's take our thought one stage further beyond using the name of God only as what graves call a word of rage. If God has indeed taken such a risk in the making of the world, then I believe the problem of suffering can't even be considered with the, uh, the idea of the suffering of God or the self-emptying of God. In recent years, it seemed to many theologians and to many ordinary religious people that we can't make any sense of human suffering without believing that God suffers with creation. As the God of love, God must share the suffering that flows from the risk. If God is finally, though not immediately, responsible for the way that creation is, God must take responsibility. Only the fact that God suffers in God's own self can make credible the tracing of suffering to the free will of creation. If a God of love exposes creation to risk, God will face the risk with those God has made. God will join with those who protest against suffering. God too protests against the damage that has happened to what God has made. In Christian tradition, this belief is expressed in the story of the cross of Jesus. God is identified with the man who hangs on the cross as a victim of human hatred. In Christ, deserted by both enemies and friends, God experiences the utter limit of desolation and abandonment. An early Christian thinker, the Apostle Paul, puts it like this. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. The cross of Jesus, as the cross of the Son of God, tells us that God takes responsibility. One modern songwriter, Sidney Carter, has a song called It Was On A Friday Morning, and the singer is complaining about all that's wrong in our world, and the refrain goes like this. It's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me. I said to the carpenter, a hanging on the tree. And the hearer says to himself, well, God was crucified. It's God they ought to crucify. This sentiment becomes unhealthy, of course, when it's used to excuse human beings from their responsibility for their own free choices. Nevertheless, if we're to attribute the state of the world to free will, the God who gave this freedom must be, in an ultimate sense, responsible for the situation. This would be intolerable if we didn't believe that God also suffers. God has always been sharing the suffering of the world. It didn't happen alone in the event of the crucifixion of Jesus. But on the cross, Christians see that fellowship of suffering is expressed most clearly. The conviction that the only God worth believing in is a suffering God emerged strongly from the experience of the First World War. Here is Max Plowman writing in 1917. Not for me the thought, your mother made your bodies, God your souls, and because you dutifully fought, God will go mad and make of half-lives holes. No, God in every one of you was slain, for killing men is always killing God, though life destroyed shall come to life again, and loveliness rise from the sodden sod. 
But if of life we do destroy the best, God wanders wide and weeps in his unrest. And here's Isaac Rosenberg again. Red fangs have torn his face. God's blood is shed. He mourns from his lone place, his children dead. To us today, it seems that among human beings, truly personal love must involve the suffering of the one who loves. The world being what it is, love must be costly and sacrificial, if only in terms of mental pain. Love is the sharing of experience and a mutuality of feeling. Sympathy must be taken in its literal sense of suffering with, so that simply to be aware of the suffering of another will mean a participation in that suffering. So even where life is running smoothly, love always means being changed by the other, and that means suffering the impact of another on one's own life. To love is to be in relationship where what the loved one does alters one's own experience. If this is true of human beings made in God's image, we must surely say the same of God, who is supremely love. But this is where someone may make an objection to the idea that God suffers. The question is this, can a suffering God overcome evil? Is God destined forever to be the victim of the very universe that God has made? I've proposed that the purposes of God can be frustrated in the short term, and we're bound to say this because of the tragedies of the world. With agony in the divine heart, God cannot, in some circumstances, shift the weight of resistance to divine love. So is this the whole story? Has God taken such a risk that the whole enterprise of creation will come to nothing? This issue is raised acutely by war. It promotes the sense that evil will never come to an end. That the same old story will be told over and over again to the last moment of recorded time. Wilfred Owen captures this feeling in his poem, Exposure. It seems to him that the whole universe is in the trenches and will never emerge from them, that the love of God and all the hopes of springtime are dying along with him and his fellow soldiers. It seems nothing new will happen, he writes. Pale flakes with fingering stealth come feeling for our faces. We cringe in holes, back on forgotten dreams and stare snow dazed deeper into grassier ditches so we drowse sun dozed littered with blossoms trickling where the blackbird fusses is it that we are dying since we believe not otherwise can kind fires burn nor ever suns smile true on child or field or fruit for God's invincible spring, our love is made afraid. Therefore, not loath, we lie out here. Therefore, we're born. For love of God seems dying. Tonight, this frost will fasten on this mud and us, shriveling many hands, puckering foreheads crisp. The burying party picks and shovels in shaking grasp pause over half-known faces, all their eyes are ice, but nothing happens. Owen complains nothing happens. Can anything happen to change things in the face of evil? Well, we must ask what it would mean for evil to be overcome, and this would surely be for all created beings, whether human or not, to turn in trust and obedience to the creator, for them to be restored to fellowship with God, to cooperate with the creator's project in creation. Evil isn't a thing, a substance to be wiped out like removing a piece of dirt. It's an attitude of rebellion against the good, a failure of response to the gift God offers. Response isn't something by nature that can be compelled. It needs the persuasion of love 
creating an answering love and so making transformation in free personalities and other beings. Now we know from our human experience that without empathy, we can't create response in those who are hostile to us and draw them into fellowship with us. At the end of the day, there will be no peaceful world until the enemy turns to us in friendship. To achieve this, we have to identify with them, enter into their feelings to win them into relationship. And this is a costly business involving suffering. In the same way, only a God who suffers can overcome evil. Only a God who participates with painful love in the lives of creatures can influence them to accept the love offered to them. It's not that God overcomes evil despite suffering. God overcomes evil through suffering. This is the Christian wager that suffering love is the strongest power in the universe. Faith bets on love. It dares to risk everything on the belief that love must overcome evil in the end, that given enough time and costly sacrifice, love conquers all. The Christian faith has a whole rainbow of colorful pictures to try and express how this suffering of God makes a difference to human suffering. And here, finally, are just two ways that we can conceive of this difference. First, it offers a consolation to those who suffer to know that God suffers too and so understands their situation from within. The Hebrew book of Job offers no answer to the problem of suffering, but only an assurance that the sufferer isn't deserted by God. God is still with Job despite everything, and Job at the end confesses, now my eye sees you. And Christian faith deepens this companionship of God by assuring the sufferer that God is suffering alongside him or her. So a theologian of our day, Jürgen Moltmann, remarks that the Shema of Israel and the Lord's Prayer were prayed in Auschwitz and that there would be no theology after Auschwitz if there had been no theology in Auschwitz. Leading on from this consolation is what we might call the power of story. Here again, we make no attempt to produce a rational argument about the problem of evil and suffering, but instead we simply appeal to the power of the story of the suffering of God which can help us to find some meaning in the story of our own lives and our own suffering. Much of human suffering appears meaningless. Some indeed can be seen as heroic, part of a great project, the death of a martyr giving himself or herself for a glorious cause. But for most people in the world, suffering just happens to us. When we can't see the sense of it, we're driven into silence. We're numbed by suffering, paralyzed in our will and our emotions. Even in war, it can happen that the stories of some who die appear to lack meaning. And here I underline that I'm talking about the First World War in particular. The poets of that war write about the laborers, the plowmen, the farmers, the clerks, the mechanics thrust into war. They, came, they come from unknown, unnoticed lives and they disappear into the unknown. Here is Sigrid Sassoon again in his poem, The Working Party. He was a young man with a meager wife and two small children in a Midland town. He showed their photographs to all his mates and they considered him a decent chap who did his work and hadn't much to say and always laughed at other people's jokes because he hadn't any of his own. That night when he was busy at his job of piling bags along the parapet, he thought how slow time went, stamping with his feet and blowing on his fingers pinched with cold. And as he dropped his head, the instant split his startled life with lead and all went out 
This feeling of senselessness won't afflict everyone in war, but it can happen on one side of the conflict or another. And it's even more likely to happen to those of us who suffer in everyday life. We may feel that like Sassoon's young man, we have made no great entrance on the stage of humanity and will make no heroic exit. Now, we may be helped to cope with suffering and find some hope in the midst of it if we place alongside our story a greater story, a story of suffering which does have meaning. God's story of suffering has an aim in view to transform human existence by the power of sacrificial love, to bring resurrection life out of the worst kind of death. Hearing the story of the suffering of God can help us to find meaning in our stories. But if we follow this line of thought, we must be very careful to stress that we're talking about each person finding a meaning for himself or herself, not having some meaning thrust upon them. We can't say to a sufferer, in the light of the suffering of God, this must be the meaning for your suffering. But our suffering can acquire a meaning. We can put the story of God's suffering alongside our apparently senseless suffering and see what meaning emerges. We can see how any terrible situation can be redeemed and good even brought out of evil. Then we might be able to say, yes, it is worth it. But it will be a yes of faith, a daring step over the precipice of suffering. Yes, um, well, of course, it takes the form of will in human life. But human beings, we know, have emerged from a wider creation. Uh, and so we would expect to see something parallel to or analogous to that will at other levels of creation. But it doesn't have to be a conscious kind of will or volition. We might think of it as a resistance to the work of the Spirit of God, which takes different forms that is very difficult to talk about. Um, I mean, there have been attempts to do this. Uh, by by various theologians um but uh, and the bible expresses it simply poetically uh, no, rather than trying to to come up with some kind of scientific view of it but that there is some resistance to god's creative spirit at every level of creation um is uh, we would expect to find because we find it in human life even if we can't completely talk about it and explain it but you see, what are the alternatives? The alternatives are that God has made this evil and suffering or that evil and suffering is somehow stronger than God or that uh, all this chaos and suffering in creation um, is due to human beings. And we know that, that scientifically that can't be the case. So if you look for alternatives, or some people have suggested it was the angels that did it, as it were. Um, so there are, there are other kinds of explanation. To me, the best one is that there is something in creation which is like this resistance to God in human life. But it's happened over so many millions of years, indeed billions of years, that it's very difficult to pin down. It didn't happen at one point. That's why I talked about a constant drift away from cooperation with, with God. If God is at work in the whole of creation, which I think we readily affirm uh, that God isn't only at work in human life, then uh, you would expect, wouldn't you, there to be some response to God or lack of response to God if God is at work in creation. So the two things belong together. I think you can't affirm that God is working in the whole of the created world if you don't expect to find both response to God and lack of response to God there. And of course, that is what we find in, in the Bible, all over the Psalms and a good deal of the prophets, though it's expressed in poetic language. 
I, I quoted some of the verses. Um, Well, th thank you very much. I mean, I, 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 I do want to underline again that um, uh, that I was talking about the First World War and the causes of that war, of course, are very different from the causes of the war that you're experiencing in Ukraine at the moment. So I, 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 you know, I want to underline that difference. But nevertheless, in as you rightly said and very helpfully you know it is in that experience of of suffering in war that the deepest human feelings emerge whatever the difference of the situation um and i think it'd be marvelous if there were a theological reflection on on that poetry that comes out of your own experience of war and i i look forward to theologians and literary um, uh, 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 critics getting together and, and working on that. I think it would be a terrific project. Thank you very much. Yes, I quoted there from the theologian Jürgen Moltmann who said that there can only be a theology after Auschwitz because there was a theology in Auschwitz. And what he was saying was that it was only because people were praying in Auschwitz and knew the presence of God there that there could be any theology after. And um, so uh, uh, that was in the context of my saying that um, that the story of the suffering of God isn't so much an intellectual argument. Um, it is first a consolation that God is with us in the worst possible time. And people knew that in Auschwitz. That, that's why Moltmann says um, the Lord's Prayer was prayed in Auschwitz and the Shema of Israel was prayed um, in Auschwitz. And, and, and secondly, that, that a meaning can emerge if we place the story of the suffering of God, which is the greatest story of suffering of all, alongside our story, but without any kind of preconception about what may emerge from that. You know, not saying, well, we can apply a theology that we developed in the past to this situation. Um, we must be open, I think, to a new theology emerging out of putting these stories together. So this terrible story that you 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 mentioned of these cities, you know, what what happens when in faith and in prayer we put that story alongside the story of the suffering God? I don't think we can we can tell what's going to happen beforehand. Theology has to be made out of that situation, doesn't it? The theology after Auschwitz um, it can't be simply the reapplication of a theology before Auschwitz but you can but it can be made it can be done because there was a presence of God there in Auschwitz and people knew the presence of God with them I I said at one point in my paper that I my own belief is that God never inflicts suffering directly. God may be ultimately responsible for the world as it is, but I don't, in fact, believe that God um, imposes suffering uh, as any kind of judgment. So that's that's my view as a theologian. Um, I understand scripture um, in this way that I I think it very likely that the writer of that scripture did think that God imposed suffering as a judgment. But I would understand it myself, listening to that scripture through the mind of Christ and uh, what he said about God, that this is a warning that when we do certain things, they have certain consequences. And so the judgment of God can be understood as the outworking of our own actions. And Israel at that time was deeply corrupt in many ways. You know, it was uh, the poor were not being cared for. Um, the, uh, they were being exploited by the rich. 
the worship of God was shallow and was not authentic. If you have that kind of society, then it is ripe, as it were, for um, um, to be uh, overcome by an invader. So um, I understand the judgment of God being God's consent to the working out of the consequences of our actions. And it's a consent that I believe God gives with a very sor sorrowful heart to say, well, if you insist on if you insist on going over the edge of the cliff, then I'm not going to stop you. Um, but all the time, God does everything possible to draw us back, as the prophets make, make clear that God it does all God can to persuade us to go to go another way. Um, now, and I certainly don't think that if a nation is suffering, that this is some kind of judgment of God on them. Um, I, I would resist strongly that view. <laughs> um, of of any any nation yeah so uh that's how i read scripture and that would be my my answer but i don't know if you want to come back on that Oh, I, I think that's certainly true, but I, but I do think there's also, you know, um, a, a truth in the idea of judgment and wrath, that it is the working out of the consequences of our own actions. You know, there, there are consequences in what we do. Uh, this is how the universe works. So um, uh, I, I certainly see this as being, as you say, post factum, but there's also, I think, a, a truth in the situation that if you're living uh, a, a life which is life denying and which is um, which is uh, being destructive of other people that you are going to find yourself also in a situation of of, of losing a great deal but mind you i this is only as things work out in that way in history um i think that God's love goes on pursuing us eternally, and that this is not the end of the story. I think it's in poetry that you, you do strike some of the, the deepest, you know, some of the depths of human emotion and experience. Um, and it's often in, in image rather than in argument that um, you, you reach the reality of human life. And all theology must be reflection on human experience. It's, it's reflection in the light of talking about God. I, I began by saying that what I was going to try and do was to talk about God and suffering together rather than trying to prove God out of suffering. How can we talk about God and our suffering? together in one breath i said um and um and it is i think in the words of poets that you often come to that bedrock of human experience of suffering but does that begin to answer the question it is partly to do with poetry being so much about image and also about compression of meaning i mean this is why poetry is is difficult it's uh, it compresses meaning so that it has a, a continual openness of meaning that you can find you know, many sides to what's being to what's being said. So the image and the openness in poetry enable this expression of human experience in a in a particularly intense way that theology ought to reflect on. Theology, of course, should reflect on prose as well, on novels, for example, that come out of deep human experience. But there is something about poetry that's particularly intense, I think. Mm -hmm.